be good morning for the Spanish people and good afternoon for everybody else. It's a great pleasure to introduce this uh, new panel or third panel of entrepreneurs. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Roure, I'm professor at ESE and uh, also president of the Spanish Association of Business Angel Networks. Uh, let's see, for on behalf of ESE and all organization, welcome to this panel. It's uh, for us, for ESE, it's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, entrepreneurship panel. Entrepreneurship is part of our DNA. Uh, we were created by uh, 50 years ago by a group of entrepreneurs, and today uh, I think it's uh, we could refer as a successful entrepreneurship uh, experience. And we are more than 100 professors and uh, uh, having programs all over the world and assigned at least for the rankings one of the leading schools in the world. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce this uh, outstanding group of entrepreneurs. We have, first of all, uh, Gorbash Shahal. Please uh, welcome Gorbash. Hmm? An applause. Hmm? <laughs> Gorbash uh, is originally from India. He moved to to U.S. at uh, the very early age, at uh, three. Uh, it was uh, 16 when he created his first company, 18 when he sold the first one, 30 million, and uh, he created the second one, doing a very good job, and it's sold it for uh, uh, 300, which is not too bad, and he's in the third company and hoping to get into 1 billion. So welcome, and thank you very much for joining us from uh, San Francisco. Hmm? Uh, we have a second speaker, Luis Fon. Luis Fon is uh, an entrepreneur from, uh, from Spain. Welcome, Luis. Please, an applause to Luis. Who is that? Luis started his first company 20 years ago. Unfortunately, it was a chapter 11, but from there he learned a lot. And now he's uh, with uh, NTR. It's been already eight years in this company, going through the third round, very successful company. So then we have two, uh, two entrepreneurs that you know pretty well. Uh, Welcome Dave McClure, that has been just a moment ago in the, in the panel. Dave, welcome. <laughs> He's been previously introduced. So also Dennis uh, Crowley, please uh, welcome Dennis. So here we are. Which one is he? Then André Bagny, uh, he's uh, in, also is in her third company. It's been already five years old in this company. He had two, two bankruptcies before, so we are, today we have a great opportunity to learn from success, but also from failure. So welcome, uh, André. And, uh, and finally, uh, Marcos Cuevas. He's in his uh, second company. Welcome. And he, and in this case, Marcos uh, didn't need uh, funding, so he's been self-funding and, and also doing very well. So finally, let's see, we have uh, the moderator will be Bernard Harnes. Bern, it's, uh, so welcome, Bern. Hmm? I would define Bern as an entrepreneur of entrepreneurs. Bern was created uh, EO, the Entrepreneurship Entrepreneurs Organization. It's all around the world, having a wonderful job of uh, promoting entrepreneurship. And on top, he's the promoter of also Gazelle. He's a publisher also in, uh, has a great book that I recommend you. And also a journalist, uh, he made contributions to Fortune. So, Vern, thank you very much. And I would like to third thank especially Vern because he's doing a great job in also promoting Barcelona as a hub for entrepreneurship. So, welcome, Vern. You got it. Let's give Juan a hand. Juan, thank you so much. Good. Well, I, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, I want to welcome everybody to the entrepreneur session. Now, you had a chance to hear from both Dave and Dennis already, and so they've got to do some double time here with us uh, this afternoon. And we wanted to provide just a little bit of structure to how we're going to kind of discuss what it's taken for them to launch and build these ventures. And we've always maintained that there are four basic decisions that the entrepreneur has to get right. Uh, these decisions are around people. Uh, strategy, execution, and obviously cash. And so we're going to structure our conversations around those four areas. But before we do, I thought it was interesting. Dennis, I don't want to let you off the hook since we just uh, heard from you. I know we were discussing before 
the world seems to have changed a little bit. And obviously, entrepreneurs have to go with what are the kind of global trends that are happening. And last decade seemed to be about stuff, you know, and you searched for stuff, and the search engines was kind of their decade. This decade seems to be about people. And I think it was interesting, Hitwise, as we were discussing, pointed out just last month that the visitors to the social sites have now surpassed the visitors to the search engines. Um, and, and I even noticed it seemed like the word happiness seemed to be like the word for this year. I know Tony Shea, who CEO of Zappos, just came out with his book last week, Delivering Happiness. Uh, Ted Leonsis, who did Money Revolution and uh, vice chairman of AOL, had his book in January about the business of happiness. Um, and, and last, there was a study that said that the key to happiness was three things. Sex, and lots of it. Uh, number two, socializing after work. And then number three, having dinner with your friends, which is one of the reasons why I love Barcelona, at least for two <laughs> of those three. Um, so is this a trend? And are you at the right time? Maybe your previous venture wasn't. What, what are you seeing this decade? And I'll open it up to, to all of you. But Dennis? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we touched on this a little bit in the, in the last panel, but we seem to be like at the, the right intersection of like people have the right devices, people know how to use social services. Um, and, you know, it's, it, I think Facebook and Twitter have done a fantastic job like teaching people how to use things like that. And it really is what allows Foursquare to come along and, and you know, I, I think be successful. Like we all have the, the right devices in our pockets. We all, have to be, you know, we all know how to use these networks and use the software. And then like the networks are already existing. And so we're, we're all actively contributing there. So. Good, good. Any other uh, reaction to how you think the market's shifting this decade? Dave? I think definitely sex is on an upward trend. <laughs> sex is an upward trend, good. Uh, Up and to the right, I believe. Yeah, well, and, and entertainment. I know, I know Best TV's got, you know, in that space, so. Yeah, yeah in, in reality, people just want to uh, lead their lives doing what they really love. And part of uh, what they really love is just talking to people, relating to people. And that also applies on, on TV as well. Good. Um, so we'll come back to that. But let's, let's hit now our four basic topics. And since we had the venture capital panel, I do want to go ahead and start with cash. And so real quick, and, and I thought one of them made an interesting comment, which surprised me, that, that the entrepreneur must kind of eat, live, breathe, and sleep thinking about always cash, getting it all the time. I've not always sensed that. I mean, you talked about you just want to fulfill a need, Dennis. So let's just kind of start here and kind of move through. How, how did you fund your venture? Well, this is not my, my first uh, company. And with the money that I made in the last one, I invested in, in my, I self-invest in this company. So you're putting kind of your own capital yeah. into it. How about the first one? How, tell us a little, just tell it, us a little it, bit about it. It was a bootstrapping company as well. Uh, we were a bunch of, of friends uh, mm -hmm. from the computer science uh, department at the U U Polytechnic University, and we decided to create uh, a mobile service. And it was a moment. It was a moment, the right moment, and uh, we disrupted it with without uh, a lot of investment. Yeah, definitely. And so, how much did you put in your new one? How much have you spent up to this point? And are you are you eating, living, breathing, sleeping, needing more cash, or? Yeah, How's it need, going? We need more cash, yeah, actually, yeah. Okay, so you're out there. So how much did you put in? Do you mind saying how much you've invested up to this point? How, we have invested uh, 1 million euros okay. the moment, the, this moment, and we are, we are searching for more investment. And, but we, here in, in Europe or in Spain, we had one thing, probably uh, it's not in the United States, that is uh, the grants from the government where the government, the Spanish government, helps to the companies. Okay. Uh, it's like free money or, or that's so. So we have that kind of deals, and, and we had money for the next months. But yes, we had to uh, start monetizing the service uh, from our customers, and we need to probably need to more money for in the future. Got it. So of that million euros, how much was your, have you already gotten some of these funds half, from the half, government? Half of that, yeah. Half of it. So you yeah. kind of put up half. Yeah. You've got the other half. Yeah. And that's gotten you up to how many employees now? Twelve. Twelve. Very good. Dave, you've, you've done this many, many times and you're now funding companies. Um, do you see the entrepreneurs 
that's their sole focus is needing and raising money throughout the process? And what did you, how much did you raise when you launched? Um, so actually, I, I did a business back in the mid-90s that was mostly consulting business, and I uh, was probably not very experienced at raising capital. I had one opportunity to do so, and I, I didn't. I don't know if that was a mistake, but it was mostly bootstrapped off credit cards and uh, many different uh, financial engineering <laughs> mechanisms, some of which weren't too smart. Um, but I think but, the story... But I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I've got a friend who has like 33 credit cards that she's embossed in a piece of you yeah. know, plastic as a reminder. So that I seemed had, to be the way you did it I pre-bubble. 11 credit cards, 110,000 in personal debt, yeah. another 150,000 in you know, debt based on the lease for our office and equipment. And yeah, it kept me up a lot at night. Um, I think, so one of the benefits of uh, these days, at least for internet startups, is uh, actually the first, you know, let's say six to 12 months actually isn't maybe that, that hard. There's okay. not a lot of hard costs in building internet startups uh, compared to maybe five or 10 years ago when you were spending a lot of money on maybe servers and database licenses and, yeah. you know, bandwidth. So mostly you're just paying for headcount costs. And it's, it's actually not that hard to maybe bootstrap yourself or one or two other people for, you know, six months. That's, okay. that's doable for a lot of folks. But I think the real gap is once you get beyond sort of twenty-five to 50000 in either savings or sweat equity, yeah. then there's a real gap maybe sometimes between, you know, the 50000 to 500000 you might need before, you know, traditional venture capital gets involved. Right. And in Silicon Valley and maybe now in New York and a few places, you know, there's lots of angel investors that help fill that gap. But in most places in the world, there's not. Even where there are traditional venture capital, that fifty thousand to five hundred thousand dollar gap—that's really the biggest challenge for a lot of startups getting off the ground. Yeah, I know Juan is part of having launched the Business Angel Network in Spain, yeah. which has been one of the more active. And, which, and I think that's why a lot of you—you're seeing a lot of incubators that are starting to come in and help fill that gap. Although I think that's really even past the incubator stage a little bit. Got it. Good. Okay. Well. Uh, Raising funds for, for me is a tremendous waste of time when you are focusing on a business. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the first time you, do, you take a look at the Adventure Capital Shareholder Agreement, you see, oh my God, this is a robbery. They are going to steal my soul, my heart, and my company. Yeah. Say, wow. But, but that's a small price to pay as long as you can get some money. Yeah, <laughs> right, 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 this is right. the point. So, well, I raise uh, 2 million, 4 million, and 22 million euros so in, the, in the last round. So, it's a good thing. But keep in mind that the first time as an entrepreneur, uh, uh, this is for the young entrepreneurs, that you take a look at the venture capital shareholder agreement, you say, wow, I will not sign this. Then, okay, you take a chill pill, you think about it, and then you sign. But it's a, it's a tremendous waste of time. But you have to do it. You have to allocate certain part of your time, maybe 20% of your time in the next five years, in order to raise funds. And it's even more difficult if you are in Europe, because if you're in Silicon Valley, you drive 30 miles, and you have a lot of people available. But here in Europe, okay, in certain parts, maybe you, got, you can go to London, to the Mayfair area, and you are going to find a lot of venture capital. But if not, it's Munich. If not, it's Paris. So you have to travel a lot in order to raise funds uh, across Europe. But what, how much did you um, put in, though, uh, initially, before you were able to raise the venture capital? Or did you get it day one, just off of your idea? No, at the beginning, we, we have friends, rules, and family. And uh, the first venture capital investment was around $2 million. Before of that, we raised uh, $1 million or so. But keep in mind that the first two years of the company, we didn't sell a dime. So we, we really need the cash. Got it. So it was, it was that kind of initial money just from your friends and, yeah. and some of your own wallet? It was a family office. Okay. We were very kind. So this is the kind of venture, uh, venture angel. Hmm? Okay. Dennis, we heard from you, so I'll give you kind of a, a break on that. Uh, Andre, what's... Uh, well, uh, for a fact, my, my first company, I, I, I started it up with 21 credit cards. So it's not such a large number. Okay. <laughs> but okay. still, it's quite a, quite a task uh, juggling them all and to, mm -hmm. y using Visa to pay off MasterCard. But um, uh, yeah. Yeah. clearly, the, my third uh, and, and successful company five years ago uh, actually started it when I went bankrupt. So I, I really didn't have any startup capital other than my goodwill. Um, and so that was with friends, families, and uh, moving along quite aggressively. But most importantly, I, I told my partner and co-founder, I said, listen, uh, raising money is a full-time job. 
So you're the expert in our industry. Uh, I'll help you with my uh, IT experience, but uh, I'll spend most of my time doing that. And uh, five years later, we've, we've actually raised uh, 4.1 million euros uh, to actually build the company. Clearly, when we started the business, we didn't really think we'd need 4.1. We actually thought we'd need two. Um, and of course, I didn't, have, I didn't have any, so it was zero. So I, I didn't start uh, anguishing over the fact that you know, I needed two million, I didn't have anything. So the way to go about doing that was just piecing it in terms of benchmarks, uh, sort of giving ourselves some objectives. We've got to develop this new module in our software. Fine, and then sell that as the right step in the right direction and get 100,000. We've got to develop module number two, get 300,000. We've got to develop module number four, et cetera, et cetera. And along the way, we turn back and go, oh, wow, we've raised 4.1 million euros. This is great. So obviously, business now is profitable. But it was quite a trialing experience that requires really full-time dedication. So and that was it, it. And I made a mistake. I should have asked along the way. Uh, so how much have you had to give up? How much do you still own of the company? Well, I, I own 33% of the business. My okay. partner owns 33 so we still own the majority of the business. So the way about going doing that was really piecing it uh, in terms of benchmarks and okay. uh, structuring it in such a way that uh, we could end up five years later still owning the majority of the business. Good, good. Yeah. And Prabhat, you want to? Sure. And you've done it multiple times. I mean, your family came with $25 in India, and the rest has kind of been history. Tell us about that first venture and how did you, how did you get it funded? Well, I started it uh, when I was 16. So uh, I tried to raise money. No one you did. would give it to me, so, uh, okay. which yeah. is understandable because of the stereotype that comes for a typical 16-year-old uh, wanting to start a company. But, uh, the thing I realized, at least from that venture, is the fact that you don't need money. Mm. You know, people come up with this connotation that they come up with an idea and they said, I need a lot of money because I want to buy X, Y, and Z, or I want to hire this many people, or I want to do this, versus kind of saying, okay, I can actually do sweat equity and get traction. And when I don't need the money, that's when people are going to come. And uh, so without raising money and even, you know, generating hundreds of thousands of dollars, I eventually even still had an exit without, uh, without even raising money at all. Yeah. The second time around, I actually raised uh, $11.5 million. That's after the company was profitable. Never used it. So again, I think as an entrepreneur, what I learned is uh, even though I didn't need to raise money because the company was profitable, uh, psychology, psychology as an entrepreneur, having that money as a cushion, uh, made me realize I could actually afford people. I could actually afford, uh, you know, having an office that could house so many people without cramming them in, you know. So making those uh, decisions was a lot easier. And the third time around, I mean, I, I, I actually raised uh, 12 and a half million. And that was just too much from it because, I mean, it was cheap capital and, you know, the investors basically knew that I could fund it on my own. So it was just a, a way to just get it off and, 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 and get to execution. Yeah, so clearly, you know, the trend is, you, you know, in some sense, you've got to bootstrap the first one, and you may go bankrupt, you may uh, make it, and then once you get the track record, then the money starts coming easier. What, what did you have to give away for that 12 on this third venture? Uh, well, How cheap was it? Uh, well, it was two months into it, it was pre-revenue, so, uh, and this was during when the markets were still very dry, I mean, very hard to raise any capital, yeah. but I raised 12 and a half million, uh, you know, giving away about 28, 29% of the company. Yeah, nice, nice, good. You know, and Katerina, fake, you know, when her and her husband launched Flickr, they did that whole thing with not raising a penny. So I do sense that there's still that kind of opportunity out there. I think the, the, the other caveat is the fact that, uh, you know, no offense to the VCs here, but VCs are not risk takers. Yeah. So uh, they're not necessarily going to go ahead and, uh, you know, give you money when you need it. They're going to give you money when you don't need it. So when you walk in with that equation of saying, hey, I need money, you already lost. Versus going into the mentality of saying, hey, this is what I've built. This is the traction. Do you want to work together? Right? It's a different type of psychology versus kind of going in and begging for money. Yeah. And we might come back. I, I know the guys with Pravaya and uh, the, the guys that funded them were right. These guys have pinched pennies and used their funding as well as I've seen any company use it as opposed to kind of go crazy. Uh, so we may come back to that on the execution piece. Let me, let me switch gears on the people side. There, you know, we've done some research at MIT and Harvard that intact teams, a group 
that had worked together previously when they launched the next venture because they've already know each other and have worked out some of those issues uh, tend to grow faster and that co-founders do better than a single founder, three do better than two, four do better than three, five do better than four. We kind of run out of data points at that. Um, Luis, you had five. Um, yeah. Tell, tell us about, about that, and is it, is it good? And, you know, Dennis, we already heard, you know, you've had your friend that kind of came with you on the next, and you, could, and you brought the six over from Google that already kind of worked together and knew each other. There, I don't think that can be discounted. So talk, tell us a little bit about the founder, five well, founders. Not good, not bad. The, the problem is finding the right partners. We, we had five partners, but two of them, to be honest with you, they were crap. They were not working, all times with problems, so we decided to buy their stake at the very beginning, otherwise it was a nightmare. Then we were three founders. Okay, we were more or less in agreement. I think that it must be a balance. So I think with Andre, we agree in the, in the previous conversation that you have to have a, a counterpart. So if everybody's thinking the same, probably you don't have the right partner. You have to, ag to disagree, but you have to agree to disagree. I mean, you, you can have controversial discussion about the business model, about the way that the company is managed, but at the end of the day, if you ar arrive at an agreement, you execute. If everybody's in agreement, probably you are not going to have enough, enough staff, enough discussion in order to drive the thing to the, to the right direction. That, that's the point. I mean, you need partners, but you need certain discussion. You need good partners. So you can have 10 partners, and you are not going to create Apple. Yeah. Okay? Did, so the five of you had not worked together before. You just, how, how, did, how did you come together? Or had you? No, some, of us, some of us, we were working together. Others, they joined the, the project because they like it. So who are the two that left? The ones you'd worked before or joined later? Yeah, at the end, the three that we stay and remain together, we were working before. So ah. it's, it's a good point. It's a, it's, in fact, it's a good point. So you need certain understanding. You, you need to know that the chemistry is going to it's gonna work. Got it. Marcos, you, you had a thought yeah. on this. Uh, my, first, my first company, uh, we were four at the beginning. Yes. And yeah, we were, we were very good close friends. And that's a point. That's a good thing. But uh, it was like something like self-employment, you know. There were people that wanted to do something, to, to do something for the world. But there were people that with different uh, visions and different missions. So the first, my first advice would be discuss a lot before you start a company. What do, we, what do you want to do? What is your common uh, vision of the future or your mission as a, as a company? The other one is uh, you need to have the same culture, work, a business culture. You want to start working at 9 o'clock, at 8 o'clock in the morning, you, you, you must agree because yes. uh, choosing a partner is like choosing your wife or your husband. You need to agree on the small things in, the, in your daily life. So uh, first is vision, mission, culture, and yes, you, you need to be uh, complementary. You need to be, uh, you, you need to have people, technical people, financial people, more marketing people. So, uh, but, um, the more people you are, the more complicated it is to put all, all together. Yeah, that's the, that's the trade-off. I mean, what, what the research found is you've got more people to kind of share the load, um, but obviously there are issues, you know, when you're, when you're also yeah. sharing the equity. But did do you, you think it's good or bad? Did, uh, you, did you get that? Did right. you get that team? Yes. The intact team? Right. You, obviously, you, you have a, a lot of... Uh, it's better than, than a founder, a standalone founder. Okay. But so it's you very, agree with it's the very difficult to, to get a, a team of four or five people working together as a funders. It's very difficult. Dave, you funded a lot of companies. What, what, have, you, what have you seen? Is there, is, if you're speaking to entrepreneurs, is it, is it the lone entrepreneur building a team? or what's, Do you have any preference? It's, it's usually not a single entrepreneur, although that happens occasionally. Uh, it's sort of a litmus test for entrepreneurs. Is, they have to be able to convince at least one other person that they're not completely crazy. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times just having two people helps to you know, de-risk that issue a little bit. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but I don't know that it says so much about the number of people, it is like the roles and the skills. Uh, so at least for a lot of stuff that I'm investing in, it's a lot of consumer internet and small business. Yes. Uh, and I've really started to emphasize the need for uh, design and user experience or some type of front end uh, developer in addition to the traditional programming, you know, back-end database person that's going, uh, that's, you know, writing code. Because I, I think a lot of the, 
you know, experience we have on the web these days is very visual, it's very emotional, very psychological. It's not always about the code and the features. It's a lot of times about the you know, way image and text and other things are put on the page. Um, and then in addition, I think having someone, I, I don't want to say it's a marketing role because it's not at all a traditional marketing role, but understanding scalable distribution strategies based on search engines and social platforms and other online methods. Um, so for me, I like to see that there is a strong engineering team. You know, usually more than one is helpful. Yeah. Um, and having some type of design or customer-focused uh, interaction, you know, is also pretty important. And then it doesn't have to be early, but I want to see that they have a way to sort of go after and get distribution. Those, those three roles, I think, are really important to sort of have at least within the first three to five employees. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Gabrashi had some, some strong thoughts on this when we were talking backstage on, did you bring members from the other previous companies with you and that it was helpful or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a big difference between, I guess, co-founder and founding employees. And I've ah, had okay. experience with the latter rather than the former. And okay. uh, the thing that I've realized is that the first five employees you hire are kind of like your dream team. Mm -hmm. So you got to get that right. Because if you don't get that right, those first five employees will judge whether or not you even have a business or not. Okay. So you pick the wrong person, doesn't execute correctly, you're probably not going to be in business. Then the, I think the next quantum leap is the first 20 employees. Because if you hire the right first 20 employees that are out there to win and, and grow, that'll you know, either tell you whether you're going to have a, a big company or not. You know? So you want to instill that same DNA that you have in that first five into the next 15. Because if you get the first 20 right, then that's the company culture. That's what's going to be the driving force for the next you know, tw uh, you know, 20 employees and so forth. Any, you know, it sounds easy, you know, just get the first five right and the next 15. Any, any specific hint any of you have or trick you've learned to weed out who you want to bring in besides passing the breath test because they, you know, they're breathing and willing to work for free? What's Make decisions to fire quickly. So you bring them on but yeah. and I mean, then you I think figure it's great it out. To, it's great to say that, hey, be really careful about hiring, be like really, you right, know, right, right. but you're going to fuck that up at least once, probably more than once. Okay. And typically, the worst mistake I've made is not hiring the wrong person, but keeping the wrong person on longer than three months. And usually within the first three months, definitely within the first six months, you know whether it's working or not. Uh, and well, and by the way, in Europe, you know, some countries, you have yeah, three so months, I'm, I'm less familiar with what months. the issues are here. That probably yeah. makes it even more challenging, but I would say consult to hire uh, for the first three months, if you can do that, okay. uh, makes a big difference. Good. Anyone else have like the, the key tip to picking yeah. the right people? I absolutely agree. So if you make a mistake hiring someone, you yeah. have to correct fast. Otherwise, you are going to have a, a partner or an employee that you don't want for for a long time, and it's going to be worse. I, agree, I absolutely agree with you on that. Good. But I don't, I don't want to let you off the hook, Gabrash. So what, yeah. how, <laughs> how, how did you find this Get Dream Team? I think what it comes down to is, I mean, I, I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people in the last 10 years, so right. I kind of look for hunger as the most important thing, and, and what are they in it for? Uh, you know, I think the, the drawback that I have, you know, being a successful entrepreneur is the fact that having done this the third time, people already think they're going to make millions of dollars, right? So, you know, that's like the first mental check now, so it's an evolving process, but at the end of the day, you got to see what are they in it for. If they're in it to make money, then Great, that should be part of it, but that shouldn't be the one that, uh, you know, the only driving force. It should be about the creativity, it should be about the ambition, it should be about the ability to innovate, right? That's all the ingredients that I look for rather than saying, you know, I'm hoping in three years from now we sell this company for a lot of money. Because you, you never start a company to sell. You know, you build a great business, and if that opportunity happens, you know, great. Uh, otherwise, you can still have other options, you know, for that company. So hunger is probably the most important thing to look for. And, and how, do you, how do you see that? Do you, do you take them to dinner and what's, how, you know? Yeah. Depending upon the role, I mean, I think you got to, yeah. you know, test your ability. And I think it comes down to the evolution of the company. Like the first five people uh, are going to make it or break it. So you got to be almost like uh, gut, your, your gut has to be absolutely sure about those. Okay. The next 15, great. I mean, they're going to provide the structure of the company. Then you actually have a very big company. Then you look for like the senior managers, how you fill in the management team. Those guys, you probably have to go ahead and you know, definitely take out to dinner and make sure that these are the right lieutenants to go ahead and hire that function. Otherwise, uh, you, know, you hire the wrong person. That's going to be a more emotional firing rather than all the other jobs that you have. 
So I want to I switch gears and then we're going to switch to strategy in a moment. One more thing on people. You know, uh, Steve Jobs early on had Regis McKenna advising him on marketing in the early days and Don Valentine. And today he has a coach, Bill Campbell, uh, that's with him every Sunday kind of for a one hour walk. Um, I've noticed sometimes I think entrepreneurs discount the importance of having kind of that key advisor or mentor. Uh, has one played a role in any of your uh, ventures? Uh, and, and how critical is that, Marcos? Yeah, yep. yeah in fact, and, uh, putting together everything that from the, first, the, the previous conversation and this one is yeah. that we use the advisory board to, to hire people because there are people are from the university, people from the financial, people from the strategic point of view. So we want, we want somebody technical, we, we asked for to the technical guy on the advisory board. Ah, so he okay. need, he's, he's somebody from outside the company that knows a lot of people then, uh, that can advise you who, who you should hire at your company. And at the same time, uh, answer, answering your question is that, yes, uh, definitely. It's something that you need because you are on the side of the company. You are on the daily basis focusing on, on your business plan, focusing on a lot of things, and you need fresh air. Mm -hmm. Every month, every week, uh, every meeting, you need fresh air from, from outside. And having an advisory board is, is a key decision for, for, for us, and I think for every entrepreneur. Day one, you had the advisory board first before your first employees, or when well, did that come? It's, it's day one, it's a, it's a period of time. You, uh, right. When you start a company, it's not a day one. You are, you are thinking about the idea, you, are, you, you need to seduce people to, to help you. So it's something that you are doing at the beginning, yes. But you had an advisor. Was there one, one guy or man or woman that was that kind of guided you and mentored you? Yeah, well, this, uh, do you want names? Yeah, yeah well, that's, okay. we'll write them down. Well, you know. one is, uh, one is uh, Ventura Barba, is from the ex-general ex, uh, manager of music in Yahoo, uh, Europe okay. and Canada. The other one is Marc Calier from the uh, University here in Barcelona. The other one is Mike McCready from, uh, from the U.S. and a very well-known entrepreneur in the music area. Um, so that's been critical. They've come out of the space. Yeah, it's, it's critical. And, okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Is, Dennis, what about you? You've, who's, who's advised you along the way? Yeah, well, I mean, in the, in the dodgeball days, it was using our, our grad school professors as, as advisors. Uh. You know, and it's, you know, it's on product and it's on business as well. Um, you know, I think for what we're doing in New York, we're in this really fortunate position where, you know, there's a whole bunch of New York startups that are going at this for the first time, and we use our, ourselves as like a support community. If you need mm -hmm. questions, you know, if you have questions about a hire or you know, equity allocation or partnership deal, whatever. You, these are people that you can, um, you know, that you can turn to and ask for advice. And uh, you know, the other thing we talked about this on the other panel is like we have this, you know, we have two investors that we also go to as, you know, we look up to them as, as mentors and they're giving us great advice. And we've got, you know, ten angels as well. And so we can call these folks up, um, and, and we do. We call them up often. And it's like this is something I'm struggling with. Like you've done this in the past. Like what, you know, what should we do in this situation? And that, it, it, I mean, I think that's a, a big part of like the angels that you bring on. You get some value out of them as well. Good. Um, Dave, I want to I want to switch gears on strategy here and, and actually kind of going back to something that our research found was that one of the people in the team needed to be focused on marketing, have kind of a customer facing activity. You were marketing at PayPal. Um, you know, thousands of companies are launching right now, particularly in this Internet space. It's so easy to do. How do you how do you get traction? How do you get up to that first million? I hear a million's not even enough anymore to make the radar in terms of users or whatever. Give us, give us the insight on how you get from zero to something. If you don't have a business model, then yes, a million isn't enough. If you do have a business model, maybe 10,000 is enough. Okay. Um, Explain so, what that means, having well, a business model. So, you know, modernization per user. Okay. So if you know if your Facebook and your monetization looks like a buck a user or even less, then yes, you may need millions of users. If you're a financial services company like Mint.com and you're making twenty five, fifty dollars per user, maybe you only need you know fifty thousand, hundred thousand users to sort of like get to you know traction. Good point. Okay. Um, but I think to answer the question more generally, um, it's 
really actually a much better scenario, particularly in the last five years, for startups to acquire customers than ever before. There's literally five, six, seven uh, new platforms that probably didn't exist five years ago that have 100 million users or more. Uh, so, you know, Google, which has existed maybe for 10 years for natural search and for paid search, uh, YouTube, which didn't exist more than five years ago, uh, several hundred million people uh, all watching video, uh, Facebook, 500 million, Twitter, 100 million, uh, iPad and iPhone, probably several hundred millions now, Android coming out soon. So there's all these different ways to go out and acquire customers, very large groups of customers, uh, on platforms which may or may not cost you money uh, and may or may not be viral, but they're a lot easier to go after than before when you didn't have access to those channels. So I think you know, my background was originally as a programmer and engineer before I went into marketing. And I think I, I had the opportunity to learn a lot of stuff at PayPal uh, you know, when some of these things were first getting going. Um, and it was really helpful, to, I think, to understand about you know, search engines and email and blogs and widgets and you know, social platforms now. So I don't think the role of marketing looks at all like what it used to be. So while I agree with your statement, uh, I don't think the answer is to go hire someone with a background in you know, an MBA or Correct. a traditional marketing background, uh, unless they did direct marketing. And in that case, actually, probably is quite useful. Uh, but understanding someone who's got an external customer acquisition focus and is looking at these online customer acquisition channels, how much they cost, how many users you can get from them, whether they convert, like that is absolutely essential behavior uh, for startups, and most startups don't hire for that. You know, they, they either hire geeks who are building product, or they have traditional marketing people who do PR, which is bullshit, and in general, not usually for most startups that helpful. Um, but understanding these online customer acquisition channels via search engines and social platforms, and really driving an analytic process, a measurable and analytic process, is, is absolutely critical, and it's, it's doable. You know, Disney, um found seven key bloggers when they launched this new part of their theme park, and those seven bloggers drove five million people to their, their website. What's, I'd love to hear from all of you, what, what was like the surprise thing you did that got a lot of attention and put you on the right radars, or was it something you did consciously? What, what were those activities? Something had to happen that put you guys ahead of your competition. Anyone want to jump in? Dennis? Well, we've just been using a lot of, you know, just social media outreach, kind of accidentally. Like, when people check in on Foursquare, they send those check-ins to both, um, to Facebook and to Twitter. And I think in a lot of instances, it's, it's useful enough or it's intriguing enough for people to see those and then send them around or sign up on their own. So it's like piggybacking on the success of other social networks to get, to get our message out. But I know you, I, I, I'm not going to let you off the hook a little bit. You know, the the back, you know, stroke uh, contest you do at, you know, South by Southwest. Uh, we've covered you at CNN. Yeah, uh, I think you get that, a lot of publicity. And yeah, is but it's not, it's not or? intentional, right? So oh, I think bullshit. this goes back to the bullshit. Really? <laughs> oh, come on. It, it, you know, this goes back to what you're talking about with, with hiring, right? So yeah. when we bring people in, we we only hire people that are passionate about the product, mm -hmm. and like, don't just tell us how passionate you are. Like. We'll go in the database and see how often you're using it and see if you're okay. telling us the truth or not. Okay. We want people that think the product's awful and we want people to have interesting ideas about it and, and that want to improve it, whether they're engineering or interns or whatever they happen to be. Um, and you know, I think that's fostered. Like we're at 20, it's really fascinating to listen to you talk about like what happens at different stages of the company. We're at this 25 person point and I think we've got that solid you know, 20 people so far that are really like setting the culture of the company. And the culture of the company seems to be you know, around people going out and doing interesting things and having a good time. And, Okay. That tends to generate press for us if we're going and doing you know, interesting things in Austin or throwing parties in New York. And yeah. you know, I think our, our users are getting behind that too. And so the company of the culture is extending back out to the, comp the, you know, the culture of the users as well. And the users are then turning into the, like, the sales folks in such a way that like, they're evangelists for the product. Like, look at the meetups that's going on here. That's not something that we planned. People are just getting together to, to talk Foursquare. Like, we love that stuff. <laughs> Good. But you'll be there. You're going to be there tonight, and you'll make something happen. Well, I just heard about it today, so yeah, I'll, I'll be there. Yeah, we'll make, I, I we'll make some fun happen. Good. Good. From, yes. From uh, being in the broadcast industry, which is yeah. really a very dinosaurish type of uh, industry, uh, there wasn't any defining moment uh, other than maybe getting the first real strong customer, which is Mediaset, uh, mm -hmm. the Italian broadcaster that belongs to Berlusconi. So that, that was, in effect, uh, the defining point in the company. 
But to get to that point, it was just a massive work, struggle, uh, and effort. So we didn't really notice any, any specific spark in the soup of life uh, of the business. It, was just, it just came about. And, and that's how, from the classic business perspective, um, we sort of evolved. That's on the one defining moment question you, you've, you've, you've asked. But you, but you got the big one then. But we got the big fish, yeah. It's a little bit like Starbucks. Put you guys on the map, Dennis. Yes. Sure. In yep. a way. Gosh, you've, you've done it three times. How, what, what have been your, your key say, marketing? I would say, uh, I mean, see, I, I operate in a much different business model than some of the other guys here. Right. I'm more in a supply and demand business. Yes. So it's connecting and having a platform. So my customer is like Microsoft. So it's like talking to that big fish rather than talking to a consumer. And you know, while you're talking to consumers, it's kind of behind the scenes. So, I, I, when it's those type of business models, I think what I've realized is that you have to have a strategy, you have to execute on it, and then after you've shown some traction, then you gotta have to make a big statement as long as you're willing to back it up. And I would say the big defining moment for Blue Lithium was, uh, you know, we, we got recognized as a disruptor, an innovator in the space by Business 2.0. Mm. We got a cover story for it and we were disrupting against Google. So they were saying actually Blue Lithium, a two-year-old startup, is challenging and disrupting the model of what Google is used to. And again, the average person would probably look at them and say, why, why in the world would you piss off Google? Well, why would you say you're trying to go ahead and beat them at something, right? Versus kind of having a strategy, executing against it, having a lot of traction for it, making that big statement and being able to back it up, then you got all these, all these other companies wondering, hey, maybe these guys are actually doing something right. Let's take a look at them. Now, did you set that article up? How, how did that article come about? Because, I mean, we'd all die to have one of those and have the media. How'd you do it? I, I would say PR has been a lot easier the third time around. Of but the first time around, I mean, I would write my own press releases and nobody would even pick them up, right? right. So it was like, you know, you're, you're a nobody. The second time around, you know, we were basically trying to, we had a PR firm, we were, they were trying to line up meetings, and it just happened to be a, uh, a quick meetup with the writer. And, uh, you know, hey, let's talk about the company. And it, it's, it's, it's kind of like that spark. They were looking at, uh, you know, innovative companies. We happened to fit the bill, and it was a surprise to us. So a lot of that stuff that makes the biggest impact PR-wise happens organically. You can never plan for it. Whenever you plan for it, then it's kind of not true because it's not real, you know, journalism. Okay, got it. Anyone else have a marketing tip that worked? You've seen a lot of them. For a lot of uh, marketing these days, I mean, there are certainly PR firms that are worth the money, but in general, uh, at least if you're going after consumer or small business targets, I think there's plenty of channels where you can spend money more effectively. And if you're going to do, if you're going to hire PR, I would just hire an independent PR professional to come in-house, I think it's a lot you know, less expensive and you probably get more time and experience. Uh, but I, something I would probably do even before that is hire just people who are knowledgeable writers in the subject matter area of your business, some college students, some out of work mm -hmm. press or uh, you know, newspaper folks, of which there are plenty these days, um, and just get someone to write on your blog about what the customer and product experience is on a daily basis. And that'll build you know, a group of articles that traditional reporters and press can then actually refer to and find on Google and you know, maybe even have a social platform strategy where you're tweeting some of that stuff out. But just like doing a regular, you know, writing something about your customer or product experience on a daily basis and focusing on the keywords that your customers uh, might be likely to search on and using those in the article headline and title is building a body of work can, can quickly be done in three months to six months' time with a very inexpensive spend. Yeah, I, I, I want to build on that. Uh, you know, I've been big fans of David Meerman Scott. You know, David wrote The New Rules of Marketing and PR. And, and I just heard him, he, we hosted him for one of our audiences, and I thought he made one of the best points. He said, if, if you want to hire somebody in marketing, don't hire anybody from marketing, but hire a journalist. You know, right now they are inexpensive because of what's happened to traditional media, Andre, to your point, and because you are what you publish on the web, and just get them cranking the YouTube videos, the blogs, and the stuff. And then Brian Halligan from HubSpot added to it, and I think his book, Inbound Marketing, by the way, is, I think, one of the best books written in terms of how-to on doing this. But Brian had mentioned, I mean, he set us down and, and said, I want you to write four headlines that got to be 10 words or less because Google truncates 
you know, on the 11th, get your couple of key words in there and write it so people want to hit it. And, I, and is, that, is that too much planning? Is that, no, is that I, being... I, I think people are really into writing a lot about social platforms and Twitter and Facebook, but they underestimate right. the importance of Google and search engines. Right. Um, and, you know, understanding the top 20 to 50 keywords in your market or product or problem space or customer space and just dominating the hell out of those keywords you know, in content and articles and search, and you can also use those on your copy for your website and in yeah. emails, but really understanding the volume of keyword activity around those keywords and which are the actual keywords that are being used uh, is really essential research, and again, wouldn't underestimate the importance of SEO, search engine optimization, you know, uh, in getting the initial product offering off the ground, understanding what customers are talking about. Yeah, even in B2B, I mean, back to your point, I saw some statistics, 76% of all purchasing decisions start by uh, someone checking you out at, on Google. I mean, Googling you, and yeah. if you're not showing up, it's, you're really not there. Let's, um, we've got 15 minutes left. I want to I switch to execution. And uh, one of them, uh, you know, what I've found in Europe, it's, it's kind of crazy, is that the tech companies here have like two week, six week development cycles and you know, many of you guys are working the 24-hour development cycle. Marcos, you, well, uh, in a couple of you reacted, man, I'd love to learn how yeah, to do a 24-hour that, development. That's the objective. What, what we are, we are, we are uh, using is GIT as a, as a, as a technology for, for all the developers to, uh, to put everything together and to, can, to be able to upload that to our service. And, the, well, we, we are an advantage. We have an advantage that we have an alpha version of our service uh, mm -hmm. working. So uh, the people that are testing our, our software right now, our service, are the people that are using it. So we don't have to be sure that we, we have done the right testing because people are doing it for us. So in, that, in, in, in this way, with this complicity from, uh, from the, uh, our um, ecosystem of users, uh, we are, they are helping us to evolve our, our service very, very fast. We do uh, everyday meetings, we upload uh, the new version of the service to, uh, to, to uh, the production, so it's, it's uh, the fast way, fastest way to, to mm -hmm. make evolve the, your service. So you're on, you're the 24-hour development, and you're relying on the customers. Maybe some days it's 40, 40, 40, <laughs> of course, eight hours. But yeah, yeah, we, we are, we are in that. That's the objective we have. Yeah. Yeah. So, so clearly you have to move fast in all these markets right now. What are, what are the things you've learned just operationally to move fast? I think uh, when it comes to execution, yeah. all of it is determined with hiring, right? So it's that hiring. And that's the people that you hire because they're the ones that are actually going to be executing when, when you're not, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've realized is like even like my, my current company, whenever I hire someone, uh, it's great to see kind of the work ethic evolve. Like, you know, I send an email at 10 p.m. Generally, it could wait, but somebody else replies back, you know, at 10.01. You know, seeing that kind of like around the clock uh, atmosphere, ambition kind of goes with the hiring process. You hire fighters, you know, they're going to go out and fight for you. So. Yeah. Uh, that's, I think, comes down to making it work and, you know, as, as well as how international and everything works, you know, r and a lot of it is international. Having people work around the clock, you have to be ahead of the game. So, like I said, all of it comes down to hiring. Yeah. Um, you know, one of my, one of the guys I enjoyed working with for years, a guy that's Rick Kay, he and his four buddies built this company, sold it for a billion and one of, in the software space. And one of the things they did is they had breakfast every Monday morning for 13 years. And that gave them this chance to kind of talk through things. And, if you, and you've got 20 employees now. I mean, you start to have communication issues when you get the second one. What, any of you have any kind of routines, if you would, that kind of glue the team together and give you this talk time? Yeah. Outside of the management meetings, I think one of the key things... Well, we said outside of management yeah, meetings, I'm, but what do you have? Do you, you meet weekly or...? Yeah, I have weekly Monday management meetings, and then uh, I think one of the key things is as soon as the, uh, the company grows beyond maybe 10 people, yeah. uh, you have to go ahead and involve everybody in the process, and that's when you kind of separate between managers and soldiers, right? 
And uh, you know, you have to have like a company all hands type meeting where it's fun, people are engaged, people see that their work is valued and the input is there. So I have once a quarter all hands meetings in. You, you know, depending upon how small it is, you can create these incentives. So mm -hmm. you know, one of the incentives that uh, that I created last uh, last quarter for my for my companies, and again, we're 45 people, so we can afford to still do it. Is nice. that if we beat our revenue and gross margin number by a dollar, I would take everybody out to Cabo for a weekend. Fantastic. So the fact that you know this incentivizes everybody from uh, you know employee that just shows up to work and does administrative stuff to all the way up to management kind of glues the team together. Where there's an incentive, everybody's going for it, everybody's fighting for it. From a managerial perspective, Andre. what we do is each time I'm, I'm in the office, uh, if not traveling two, three times a week, uh, I always invite all the managers to lunch. Uh, and my partner does the same. So there's always we're always having lunch together, paid for by the company. And uh, this is always there's always something to say, always something to share, and that always stimulates more thought, more conversation, which begets more more ideas. And then we've been doing that for five years, and that has built really a strong, strong, uh, cohesive team by doing that, not worrying about uh, uh, really forcing it upon a, a meeting, but really doing it in a natural setting, which is eating, I guess. Yeah, which is a, a big thing in Spain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We like to do that. Dennis, any, yeah, anything we're, you've we're learned? We're struggling with this right now. Like, I think our biggest problem is like processing, making sure everyone talks to one another. Like, we outgrew our space, and now we're on two different floors, and you know, we rotate different groups down, and we try to mix them up so everyone talks to one another. Like, we do the, you know, the standard, like, the different teams will go out for lunch, and we go to baseball games and go out for drinks. Um, I think one of the more interesting things that we've been doing is yeah. we've been doing these things called uh, stand-up meetings, in yes. which, you know, Everyone that's at the office that day just gets together for a quick meeting. It might last five, seven minutes, yeah. and no one sits. You have to stand up, and it's just if you're having something that you're having a problem with, you just say it out, and someone will figure out like who they need to you know discuss with or team up with to fix it. Uh, that you know that gets solved, and everyone goes back to work. So we do this a couple times a week. A couple times. Yeah, yeah. Just these these stand up meetings. Sometimes they're ten people, sometimes they're twenty people, but it's like okay, quick status. Everyone stand up. What do you need help with? Okay, and then everyone goes back to work. No, that's fantastic. Yeah, Marcos, you wonder. Yeah. Dance. I totally agree with him. The, the, all the problems we have in the company, the main problems we have is communication. Yeah. And one way is to, to have this breakfast, uh, but I think the space is key. Because we, we used to work in departments, we used to work in, in that way, but uh, we are, right now we are in a, in a building where we have separate spaces where we want to move to a, a flat space. Mm -hmm. uh, because Informal communication happens in that way. You are listening to the, the guy there are at, you, at the table, at the, your workspace, uh, but you are in a conversation, but you are getting information, informal information all, all the time. So that's something that's important. I agree with Dan with that. It's space. You, it's not good to have uh, to build to build to flat uh, uh, separate spaces to, to work together. Yeah, and, I, and, and, and Dennis, I think you made a good point. I've, I've seen it just the, the minute a company moves to a second floor, yeah. communication stops. And I think it's a credit to you to have recognized that and have dealt with it. I've seen companies make sure the restrooms are just on one floor and the break room's on the other or something like that. Luis, how do you handle the, the communication uh, issues? Oh, wait, oh, oh, I missed. Me? No, Andre. No, no, no. Oh, Luis. Well, our case is, is more difficult because we have offices in Dallas, in Paris, in Barcelona, in many countries. Yeah, so how do you handle that? So, well, a conference call, a daily conference call with Skype, uh, people talking each other. We have something called a morning hustle or something like that. So every day we meet certain people at 10 o'clock and we speak for half an hour, but we repeat the meeting in the afternoon for the people which is in Dallas. So this is, this is something that is working very well. But for me, it's very unrealistic to think about 24-hour development cycles. Because in our case, we need minimum six, eight weeks in order to do that. Because it's a tremendous testing that we have to do with 17,000 corporate clients worldwide and 14 languages. Every time you touch a comma in yeah. the wording of the product, you think about it. Other, otherwise, yeah. it's, it's very difficult. And imagine, okay, well, we did a, a change tomorrow and the product is not going to work in market anymore. Clients are not going to be happy with that. 
So it's, uh, we try to speed up because we, we have a testing bed in India. So we have a, a people in India just testing the product overnight. So we finish programming here and they start testing. And then the day after we have the testing, the results, and we can improve the product. It's working. However, in the communication is the toughest thing. In fact, we have to have one person in India working with us in order to do all the relation in order to prove the testing. Otherwise, it's impossible. But communication is key, and meetings probably are not enough. So every, every year, we, meet the, we have something called a brain trust, mm. and we put together employees, clients, and people in the industry in order to share the strategy, in order to think about new ideas and all these kind of things. And every time we have this kind of brain trust session, the people is pumped. And I, I, I see an increase in the productivity of the team after this brain trust. The, the problem is that we cannot do it every week. Um, you know, it's been pointed out that this decade, uh, we've, there's an unbelievable blue ocean opportunity in that uh, the middle class is going to expand from 1.8 billion to 3.2 billion. This is it, unprecedented in history that the markets can expand by 77 percent. The issue is it, it's all in the East. It, it's India, it's China, it's Indonesia, the whole bit. Um, what are your thoughts over the next 10 years? Because uh, several are quite U.S. centric. I know Dennis, your session got into that a little bit and mentioned, you know, your, your biggest uh, group or something was in Japan, but what are you doing to look east as opposed to west? Anyone? D Dave? So I guess I, I have a little built-in advantage here. My wife's Japanese and our nanny's uh, from Beijing. So our okay. kids are actually speaking three languages. Uh, and I'm trying to brush up on at least my Japanese. I don't know about Mandarin. Um, uh, so I, I think that, you know, a lot of people have been focused on sort of the U.S. and the EU markets. Right. Uh, this is one place where I actually think the EU uh, countries have an advantage over the U.S. because we tend to think only about English, and at least the EU countries think right. in multiple languages. But I think those languages need to include, uh, at the very least, English, Mandarin, Spanish, uh, and they probably should also include Hindi uh, and Portuguese uh, and Arabic, which I think are all of those languages are now 500 million global speakers or more. Yeah. Um, so recently, I invested in a company that's actually in Japan, but uh, does language translation called MyGengo, and another company called uh, Viki, which is uh, doing subtitle translation for videos. So uh, I think that language is a growth market, uh, and in particular, translations from and to many of the popular languages and those that are in you know, high GDP countries also are interesting. Um, looking out maybe five or 10 years, I think, Definitely Southeast Asia looks really interesting. 600 million people in that market. Uh, Indonesia, and, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines are all growth markets. Um, and you know, I think we know a lot about the BRIC countries and their growth opportunities, but I think there continues to be a rise of the rest of the world to you know, sort of somewhat similar uh, average economic standards, and that creates a lot of opportunities for everybody. But is it sufficient just to make it in the U.S. and then obviously you can go everywhere else? Uh, I was actually in India a few weeks ago and I hadn't gone in like 10 years and what I saw was like there's so many, I mean, the, the middle class boom actually affected most uh, industries that everybody needs to live. So, uh, you know, the, some of the biggest billionaires are the guys that are the CEOs of the mobile companies, right? Uh, other billionaires in, you know, uh, in India are the guys that are actually the owning the media sets or so forth, right? So a lot of the businesses that thrive are the ones that people consume and need every day in the East. So that's why the middle class boom is affected there. But if you look at some of the biggest disruptive technologies, they still all come out of you know, America and, mm. and Europe, right? I mean, Facebook is still the dominant social network uh, of, of India. So you know, I, I think it comes down to once you've successfully deployed your business in America, then you basically can take it anywhere else. Yeah. From, okay. from our perspective, we're, we're focusing on territory that's more familiar, like Brazil uh, and Latin America, uh, where also the middle class, as you've alluded to, is, is exploding. And so it, it makes it easier for us to actually work down there and, and, and bridge the, what, what little cultural differences you can find from a strategic point of view. Perhaps in five years further down the road, we would expand more in Asia, but we still have a lot of work to do uh, with, uh, with Latin America. 
Got it. And I, want, I do want to put a plug in for Barcelona, as Juan had mentioned. I, one of the main reasons I moved here from the States is just geo um, location wise, it, it's crazy. This is exactly the right time zone to be in to both travel and do business globally. Uh, I can be on with Asia in the morning at a reasonable time, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. I was on even with Australia this morning. Uh, and then in late afternoon, early evening, you're on with uh, the West. And then when I was in the U.S., it was so hard for me to communicate with India and Japan and all those others. So just a plug for you guys, not in, not in this part of the world, uh, come to Barcelona. We, we would love to, we'd love to have you. Um, you bet. And it is the nicest city in all of Europe. So um, we've got about a minute left. Let me, let me, let's just do a quick lightning round. We'll start here and finish out. So what's your last thought relative to this whole entrepreneurship run that you'd leave with the audience? Yeah, well, uh, think about uh, what do you want to do, to, uh, what do you want to offer to the world? Uh, because it's, it's, uh, you, it's what you are going to get. And it's going to cost you something. It's, it's going to cost you something that it's, it must be worth uh, your effort. Yeah, including your marriage. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I just got back from traveling a bunch in Asia, and I'm spending a little time in Europe. And I think one thing is, you know, Silicon Valley is uh, really not a specific location anymore. And I wasn't the first one to say this, but uh, it's really a state of mind that I think is being exemplified all over the world. So. Uh, if you've got a big enough internet pipe and some talented folks, uh, you can really you know, build businesses from almost anywhere. And I think that's really a wonderful thing. There's a lot of opportunity on a much lower cost basis for building businesses from anywhere in the world. Very nice. Luis? Well, uh, I fully agree with you. For me, Barcelona is one of the best places in order to create a startup. The truth is that some of the uh, international uh, venture capital entrepreneurs are coming here to create their own company. Think about a company called Review Pro uh, with a North American uh, founder or uh, artificial solution with a Scandinavian founder. All these people is coming here, gathering international teams to Barcelona and creating companies that are doing business worldwide. Good. Dennis? Uh, this is like really cheesy. My mom used to always say, uh, you know, do what you love and the rest will come. And I'm like, that's not the way it works. Um, but, you know, from ten, you know, I was lucky enough like 10 years ago to find the stuff that I really enjoy building, which is the stuff that interacts with the real, the real world. And I've been chipping away at it for 10 years. And we haven't made it yet, but, like, it's fun to work on and I enjoy going to work every day. And it's, you know, we're, we're getting to that point where just do the stuff that you really enjoy doing. Good. Andre? I, uh, I never held a job. Uh, and I became an entrepreneur 17 years ago because I really wanted to lead my life doing what I really love. And, uh, and if that meant actually earning a living doing what I love, then I thought it would be worth a life living. So that, that's, that's for me, entrepreneurship. And I, I guess for me, uh, surround yourself around the smartest people and try to actually hire people that are even smarter than you because people make or break a company. So if you surround the right people, you'll have a very successful company. Good. If you would, give a huge warm thank you to this panel. You guys, thank you so much. <laughs>